So this is where we're picking up with the Gilded Age. Keep in mind, the Gilded Age comes after the Reconstruction. I've got dates here, but these dates aren't set in stone. Um, and one thing you have to realize is, in few things, few things in history actually start at a certain date. Unless it's a war, it's hard to say, this date started, this date ended. Time periods or time errors, if you like the Gilded Age or the Civil Rights Era or the Cold War, it's never an on and off switch. But this gives you kind of idea of the time period we're working at, um, 1880s when we're going to start. But the Gilded Age is a part of America that um, is often forgotten about. Um, and it showed America a different pathway in history. The first half of U.S. history, um, you're always taught how we didn't want the big government involved, how we didn't want a replication of a tyrannical government like the King of England, right? So government stay out. Now, starting with the Gilded Age and the second half of U.S. history, that's when things change dramatically, and that's when we start seeing the government get involved, and people are going to want that. They're actually going to demand it, uh, that the government should get involved for our protection against um, corporations, um, against each other sometimes. Um, so that's where it's starting off. This is why the Gilded Age is so important. It's a, it's a turning point um, in U.S. history, I think we can argue. Um, and now we're going to head down a different path. So let's begin. So I'd like to start off with this uh, picture when I talk about the Gilded Age. Um, you see the color is supposed to be gold. And that's exactly what the word gilded means. Not used often in modern times, but gilded is like saying something is gold plated. So the inside is not gold, but on the outside it is. And it looks good if you just look at it from the outside. This is a coin to describe this age, this era, this time period by Mark Twain. He's, going, he's not the only one to call this, but he, he's one of the ones, uh, more famous ones. He's going to call it uh, the Gilded Age because when you look at America, during the Gilded Age, it looks great. There's factories because we're in the middle of we our second industrial revolution. So there's factories, which means more jobs, um, which means more jobs, more money for people. Um, we see a huge influx of immigrants coming over looking for living that American dream more now at this point in history than ever before. We're going to see <clears> – <throat> sorry. We're going to see um, products. As more products are made, they become more affordable. More people can afford more things with more jobs. Um, so the basic standard of living actually gets better and better. Um, it feels that way. It feels like there's more money um, and things are better, especially for economy. Um, and you're, it is right after Civil War Reconstruction. So things look great from the outside. But Mark Twain, amongst a few other people, are going to argue on the inside it's not that great. Those guys that worked in the, at those factories now are working 14 hours a day. Dangerous jobs, sometimes few, if any, breaks at all. Uh, you break your arm, too bad. You break your leg, too bad. You die at the job, too bad. You don't uh, agree to do something risky, you're fired. Somebody else comes in. There's no government rules. Like, even if you want code, you say, hey, I need a, a rope tied to me before you make me go all the way on top of this side of this building. You can't guarantee that. Your boss says, no, just climb the building. You're screwed. That's the way it works. Um, so there's no government regulations whatsoever. And even with like child labor, kids are going to – forced to go to uh, – or go to work. Um, they're taken advantage of. And they work uh, long hours for very little pay. But there's no government rules or regulations stopping that. So the ones that are benefiting are really these corporations and these wealthy, wealthy, ultra-wealthy businessmen. But deep down, the common person is not doing that great. So on the outside, gold looks wonderful. On the inside, not so much. I, I also use this as an example if you buy a used truck that's been painted, fresh paint job, looks real nice, real clean. But underneath that paint, it's rust. It's not holding up. It's pretty bad. The true value isn't there. Um, this is the Gilded Age that we're talking about. So when you think of the Gilded Age as time period, that should help you uh, quite a bit. Now, if America's gold-plated, what makes it so great in gold? Well, this is its second industrial revolution. We had the first one. It's more based on water power than anything else. But now we're seeing a big focus on coal. Um, also, more importantly, are a few things start to happen that really kick uh, everything off. Uh, the number one thing I want to talk about that I think is often forgotten by Americans is the Bessemer or Bessemer process. Depends on where you're at. Some people say Bessemer. Some people say Bessemer. 
Bessemer or Bessemer. But anyways, this process itself um, was a way to make steel extremely fast compared to the older way. You see, iron is taken from the ground. It's dug up iron. Um, it's melted down. It takes a whole day. You pour it, make steel. It takes all day to make five tons. Five tons of steel takes all day. With the Bessemer process, um, this guy named Andrew Carnegie hears about a Scottish bullet maker that has a new way to make steel a lot faster. And he visits him, and it turns out this process, the Bessemer process, is a way where you're going to heat the iron up so hot it becomes liquid. Like it looks like liquid lava if you've ever seen it. Um, it's so hot, it's a liquid. Then you blast oxygen through it. And once you blast the oxygen through it, it burns up all the impurities and carbon that you don't need. Um, uh, and that actually makes the iron weak. And then once you get rid of all those impurities, you can take that hot iron, pour it into a mold, like a, a mold, like a... a for a beam for a uh, railroad or a building, you pour it, and once it dries and cools down and hardens, it's now steel. Iron and steel are two different things. Iron, we can get it from the ground, and you can bend it if enough weight's on there, but steel, that's another story. But anyways, it used to take forever. Five tons would take all day. With this Bessemer process, now it's 15 minutes. And that's what Andrew Carnegie did. He saw what that bullet maker did, and these huge canisters here would be filled with melted iron. That's how big they were. Um, and then they would heat them up, push oxygen through, burn out the impurities, and then they would tip this over using all these cranks and pulleys, and the top would pour out the hot iron into some mold and make steel beams, usually for buildings or railroads or whatever you need the steel for. So think about that. A day, five tons. Now you can do it in 15 minutes. Imagine how more affordable steel becomes, which means now you can have buildings so tall, they scrape the sky, right? Um, before that, wood buildings couldn't get that tall. Brick buildings couldn't get that tall. You see, this one is a brick foundation, right? First story is brick. The rest is wood. You get more than six stories. You're, you're lucky if you got a six-story wood building. But with steel, you go pretty tall. And now that steel is cheap and affordable, you can afford to make a tall building. So things change dramatically with the best similar process. Uh, it's one of the most important uh, discoveries and what makes Andrew Carnegie so wealthy. He produces so much of steel, he's going to dominate the steel industry. Um, he puts everybody else out of business with his new uh, means of production. Also, widespread use of electricity. Somebody asked me in class the other day, uh, during saying electricity was around 1872. I'm not saying that because technically telegraph is electric impulses sent through wire, um, just dots and dashes of it, right? Um, but electricity wasn't widespread, wasn't everywhere until roughly the 80s. And even then, even then, keep in mind, places like rural Tennessee, they don't get electricity until 1930s. So um, it's not everywhere, but now we're going to start seeing it in more major cities and get pushed out. Speaking of cities, it is important to realize that if you have more factories, whether it's steel, oil, or anything, it means you're going to have bigger urban areas. The word urban is the same thing as city, okay? Rural, or U-R-A-L, is the countryside. Don't get those confused. You need to make sure you understand that in general, right? Suburbs or areas outside the urban city. So we think of Houston as urban. The outside areas like Cypher, Pasadena, maybe Pearland, um, Sugarland, those are suburbs to uh, Houston. Just keeping that in mind. Um, also, inventions are created now, are needed, um, and you're thankful that they're created. This is a picture of actually an elevator. The passenger elevator um, is invented for these skyscrapers. Um, imagine how inefficient or how impractical it would be to have a skyscraper until you have an elevator, especially once you have an electric elevator. All right? That changes everything. All right? And of course, you can go see the big, beautiful skyline of Pittsburgh. Um, that's actually where steel plants are located. If you're curious as to why, or uh, if you're curious if it has anything to do with the name of the football team, yes, that's why it's called the Pittsburgh Steelers, um, because it's steel plants of Pittsburgh in that area. Supposedly, Jerry Jones, um, or Dallas Cowboys, when he built his new stadium, refused to buy uh, steel from Pittsburgh and bought it from China because he hates the Steelers so much. Uh, but who knows if that's actually the truth.
All right, so a couple guys you need to know, and this is really big with our state test in Texas, um, Alexander Graham Bell, which most people know him for the telephone. Um, and that's right. Uh, if you keep that in mind, he is going to uh, create a telephone, which really was just a complex version of the telegraph. Um, but it does uh, create instant communication um, for person to person, for common person to person. Telegraph requires somebody to translate and somebody that knew Morse code. Um, but that telephone, it's, anybody can speak into it, anybody can listen. All you got to do is get it set up. So that is a pretty big deal for the second industrial revolution for the Gilded Age at this time. It is interesting because Bell Telephone Company will eventually become American Telephone and Telegraph Company. You know them now in days as A T and T. If you're ever wondering um, where they get the uh, name from, um, that's where it is, AT and T. Um, but that's a pretty short version of uh, Alexander Graham Bell. Thomas Edison is a little more complicated. When you're young and little, you taught how he persevered, how he, no matter how many times he failed at creating this light bulb, he eventually found out how to do it, and he's an inspiration for many. And he's not the only inventor at the time. There's actually a man far more intelligent than him named Tesla, um, Nicholas Tesla. If you get a chance, uh, just type in TED Talk Tesla, and you see a really interesting video of a magician that presents the story and life of Tesla. Um, but our history books in, in America tend to forget Tesla. Uh, Edison was a better businessman and tricked Tesla. Uh, he made Tesla look crazy and silly. Um, nowadays, we look back and we think, wow, that guy, he was just so far ahead of his time that he may have looked crazy to them. Um, that's why most people in science and do appreciate him. Elon Musk, the owner of Tesla company, names Tesla cars after him. Nikola, which is an EV company, uh, they name their using Nikola Tesla's first name. Nikola Tesla is a, a genius. But your history books and state tests don't mention him yet. Um, Thomas Edison is our guy because he comes up with the light bulb. Now, this is a pretty big deal for society. Because now, and this is what's really important is that you understand, is that lights means that factories could work at night. So as great as a light bulb is for families and homes, eventually, now you can work at night. Imagine working in plants and the sun goes down and you shut everything down. No, now you work over at nighttime. You have three shifts. Factories can work nonstop. You just bring in more people with different, a different shift of workers to come in, which means you produce more which means things are cheaper, but also you provide more jobs and more people. The lights change everything, um, how we live. No longer are we restricted to nature and her time windows. We took a uh, full advantage of that. Uh, electric motors are uh, important as well. Uh, rarely asked about on tests. Uh, typically, people forget about this. But electric motors are going to allow you to put your factory or plant in other places than just simply close to rivers or close to a coal supply. You could have a factory anywhere now. It does make sense to be closer to waterways because for transportation wise, but um, electric motors are going to change everything. Um, and Edison is also known for his electric motors, um, also his uh, uh, power stations to supply electricity from city to city becomes well known. Um, down here, I have a few things. We already talked about Edison's light bulb. We already talked about Jackson Graham Bell's telephone. We talked about the passenger elevator, how important that is, obviously. Airplanes are obviously important at the time. Notable inventions, the electric typewriter and electric sewing machine really are important. You don't realize it, but imagine a printing press to electric typewriter. Imagine a sewing machine to electric sewing machine. Imagine how things are going to change dramatically in plants or factories, textile factories. They can produce a mass number of clothing, really affordable. And imagine women at home that can do this stuff now. Imagine if you're at home and you have an electric sewing machine, or even if you have a mechanical sewing machine instead of a, a do it by hand sewing machine. Or you have so, and eventually electric vacuum cleaner. You have so much more time on your hands. The technology revolutions like this allow women at home to actually get an education, even if it's self-taught. And you can start seeing the rise of women in society. Actually, early on, I would argue as early as 1900. Once women aren't forced to like do survive, feed the cows, plant, take care of the garden, take care of the kids, go back out, um, even from chopping firewood, anything like that. Once they have time, they can get educated. And this is the rise of the woman. That's my argument. By 1920, they finally get the right to vote. So I think that's a fair uh, debate to have. So the rise of big business. And this is a perfect example of why we start expecting the government to actually step in and do something for us, the consumers. Now, on this slide, I have a few things um, 
that we should talk about. Uh, the railroads are our first corporations. I talked about that before last semester and so forth. And you can just see by the numbers, railroad was a monster, a, a huge task. Um, workers were treated horribly during it, paid very little. Um, even some of the money was stolen from them by their bosses who charged them rent for living in the tents and stuff. It was horrible, right? It does open up transportation, does open up communications. But for, for purposes of this class and the stupid state test, um, we do need to understand that the railroads develop a national market. Look at this map. If you just take one quick look, you'll see that railroads are linking the whole country together by 1895, which means if I own a company called Sears and Roebuck right here in Chicago, and you live in San Francisco, and you buy a dress from me, I can send it on Transcontinental Railroad, and it can get there. I can send you anything. I mean, Sears and Roebuck is known for their Sears and Roebuck catalog. That's what they did. They sent a catalog out. You filled out order form, sent money, sent it to Chicago, and they were able to send stuff all over the country using these railroads. And then eventually, they have a national market to sell. Imagine now instead of just selling to your local people, maybe within 20 miles, your local town, now you can sell all over the country. Now you can make a lot of money and become a corporation. And when the Bessemer process came out and still became so much more cheaper, there are more railroads. So there's more railroads because um, they're less costly to run, less costly to build. They charge you less for shipping. You get charged less for shipping. The prices, uh, the product becomes more available and you can send out more stuff, right? It's it's amazing the transformation we see in the, tra the railroad allows for that national market that we have. I have something else on here that I, I do want to pay attention to. <clears throat> At this point in time, we do have um, a firm uh, belief in a free enterprise system. Sometimes it's also often called free market. And sometimes we refer to it as capitalism. And capitalism, free market, free enterprise system, it all describes the American economy. And the idea is that the business, a private business, can compete with little regulation from the government. The government's gonna step out of it. That's what all three of these definitions mean. It's just a different way of uh, saying um, free market. It's free enterprise, it's technical way, free market, it's short way, and capitalism is typically what you see is referred to quite often. Uh, there's a massive debate how great this is um, for individual countries, but for us, that's what we're gonna look at. And it's really been truly free enterprise, free market up until this point in history. This point in history, we see the change. Now that whole concept, and the government staying off goes back to uh, laissez-faire. Um, and I always look at laissez-faire and I tell students, hey, just think of the word, the phrase, hands off. Hands off. The government keeps their hands off the economy. Don't interfere whatsoever. Okay. But at this point in time, people say it's too much. Corporations are too big. That was great when you didn't have corporations, you had business, but now you have corporations that are too strong. Take a look at this picture, which we've seen on a star test before. Okay, These guys, these big guys in the back, these all represent giant corporations that control um, a sector of the economy. You know, railroad, uh, coal, oil, steel, these guys all represent a sector. When you look at this picture, you see these guys with all the money, right? They're the wealthy ones. And you see all these little men looking back this is these little guys are Congress. You can look just from this picture. Who has power in Congress? Congressmen? No. Well, these guys, what we call the monopoly. All right. So, and you heard of that game before, right? You've heard of monopoly. Right. A monopoly is essentially a business that controls an entire sector, uh, a product, or something like that. So, for oil, if one guy controls all the oil, he controls the price how it's delivered, how it's made, the quality of it. Um, I like to use example of TVs. Um, if company A makes, when I, grew, right, when I grew up, there were TVs, right? But they were big, bulky, heavy TVs, right? They were tube TVs. They weren't thin screen or anything like that. If company A makes, that, makes a TV like that, right? So company A makes that kind of TV. And along comes company B, we'll call it LG. They make a flat screen. Consumers like you or me, we're, we're going to want to go to the better TV. 
and LG made affordable flat screen. That's pretty cool. We're going to start buying flat screens. Now, company A, they've got to adjust their product. They've got to make it cheaper. they got to make it innovative. They need to do something different. So maybe they say, oh, hey, hey, that's a 720 flat screen TV. Let's make a 1080. So company A creates a 1080 flat screen TV. Now LG has to compete with that. They have to make their own. Can they make it as cheap and as affordable? If so, they compete with business. So you and me are benefiting already. First of all, they're coming up with new TVs. And then you have, say, a company RCA comes along, and they – they make a plasma TV. Wow, oh, everyone wants a plasma TV. LG reacts with the LED TV, right? Company A comes back with a 4K TV. And then we got the QLED TV. Uh, and then we got the nano cell technology. And then we got the big ones and flat ones and 3D ones. You and me as consumers, the people benefit when there's competition, right? Think of the alternative. Think of company A is the only company that makes TVs. Would they ever make better ones? No. If the government controlled it too much and said, Company A, you make TVs, you're the only one that makes TVs, go after it. Company A would never make an affordable TV. They charge as much as they want. They would make as many as they want. They would never be innovative and try something new. Why would they? Because you have to buy from them. But free market says the government stays out and they can do whatever they want and compete with each other. That's great. But if one gets too big and too powerful, the others can't compete. We need competition. So, uh, since you have these giant corporations, and it really starts with railroads. Railroads were the first giant corporation, so it makes sense. Government says enough's enough, and Congress will actually pass the Interstate Commerce Act. And it was primarily aimed towards the railroads. These were the guys who were using unfair practices um, and charging their clients. Um, if they thought they could charge more to somebody, they charged more. It wasn't based on how much it cost to ship grain, it was like, hey, we can get all the money from this farmer. We can choke him and get all his money. And it became so unfair that eventually uh, Congress ends up and says, okay, we're going to pass the Interstate Commerce Act. Uh, the word commerce, I always tell students, hey, it's just a fancy word for the, for the word business. Interstate Business Act, right? And if you're saying, oh, that's not constitutional, keep it in mind, it literally says in the Constitution, uh, the federal government can regulate commerce state to state. Interstate commerce. Railroads were the first target to fix these railroads and unfair practices. Um, it wasn't right. Now, eventually, they're going to take a step further and you're going to see these corporations and these monopolies and their unfair practices. They're buying out other companies, they're choking other companies. Rockefeller did this with oil. He would uh, tell the railroad companies, Hey, you're shipping all my oil. That's great. But if you ship any of my competitors' oil out, I'm not going to use you anymore. And the railroad had to give in. The railroad said, all right, we, you ship so much oil, we have to have your business. And they tell this other company, sorry, we're not, we can't ship your oil. The other company goes bankrupt. Rockefeller steps in and buys the other company. That's totally unfair and wrong, right? Um, so the government stepped in and they created a Sherman Antitrust Act. Right? When you see the word trust, back then, that was the same word as monopoly. So I always tell students, hey, if you see trust, just think of this word as the word monopoly. And if you do, every time you see a Sherman Antitrust Act, you think Sherman Anti-Monopoly Act, and you know exactly what it does. It meant the government could break up big business monopolies. And even today, this affects us. Recently, T-Mobile was trying to merge with Verizon. And when any company merges, they have to get the approval of federal government. And, and they didn't approve it. Uh, they said, no, you'd be too big and too powerful. And although the argument was, like, hey, there's AT&T, there's Sprint, there's other ones. And I said, no, that would make you too strong. Even at t couldn't compete with you. Um, and so eventually, over time, you'd have the full control of cell phone service. So Verizon Wireless and at t weren't allowed to merge. It was illegal and not allowed. And so T-Mobile ends up merging, I think, with Sprint or somebody differently now. But nonetheless, that's when the government starts stepping in. The first time is with the Interstate Commerce Act, mainly with railroads. But eventually, they're extended to Sherman Antitrust Act. I think of it as an anti-monopoly act to break up those monopolies. But you can see why they thought it was a good idea. Just think about it. Uh, the highway of competition is stalled and stopped. People can't compete because one monopoly, one trust controls everything. And the federal government is going to break that monopoly up and allow people to compete. 
So when you're thinking big government, you hate it. You see why now things change dramatically. So I always laugh at eighth grade U.S. history teachers. They're so anti-government because the first half of U.S. history, everybody was. But once you start teaching past Reconstruction, past 100 years, 120 years, 150 years, you're like, oh, wait a second. I can see why we're at where we're at today. Okay, so you notice I don't have anything underlined on here or bolded to highlight. I just really want you guys to understand what's going on in the Industrial Revolution and the Gilded Age. And some of this you know already. Like Children were working in huge numbers. One-fifth of children under 15 worked. I've seen a statistic as high as one-fourth of children. Um, horrible, dangerous jobs. And yes, it was because their hands were small, they didn't get side machines. But that wasn't the only reason. You got to think about it. If your employer and you're hiring people to work, who can you boss around, a grown man or a whole bunch of children? A grown man tells you he's going to go take a Russian break, you're going to say, okay. Uh, you're less likely to fight with them. But kids, you can boss them around, tell them whatever you want to do, and there's so many kids out there, you just scoop them off the street, pay them a little bit of money, and to them, that's a little bit of money. Take it or leave it, that concept was, hey, if you don't like it here, get out. So, for instance, if uh, one of my employees said, um, I'm done uh, with this. Give me a raise. I want a little bit more money. I'd say, no, get out and just hire somebody else. There's so many other people ready to work. Conditions are horrible. I talked about this before, how um, you risk your life. There are no, there are no safety codes. There's nothing there. The government did not regulate. If you got hurt too bad, so sad, you couldn't work. Um, things are pretty tough, especially at those steel plants. Long hours, 10 to 14 hours a day. Where we're located in Baytown, a 12-hour shift isn't a huge deal, but you don't do that every single day except Sunday. Um, eventually, you're going to see why this turns into eight-hour day and 40 hours a week becomes your standard. Um, this is the beginning of it. Um, this is how bad it was actually to work here, but things are, going to ch things are going to change for the better. And that's really due to unions. It's the first time we introduce it into this class, so I want you to understand what a union is. Think of... An example would be in my classroom is full of students. I got 30 students in there. Um, imagine if they're working for me. Um, everybody's working at a factory. I'm the owner of that factory. And one student comes up to me, calls Sebastian. Sebastian says, hey, I demand more money, safety codes, and some health insurance or something like that. I say, no, get out, you're fired. I just replace them. You could do that back then. But everybody gets together. All 30 students get together. Like, hey, we work for this guy. If we all unite together, then we have more influence. So everybody unites behind Sebastian. They say, Sebastian, we're here with you. Sebastian, uh, everybody's united behind Sebastian. He forms a union. Everybody's united. He comes up to me and says, hey, we want uh, more pay. I say, nope, I'll just fire you all. And he says, fine, we, qu we quit or we protest. Um, we go on strike. Uh, we slow down work. I could fire everybody and replace them. But if I replace everybody, that's going to take time to train. And even if I re replace all of them with a whole 30 more new people, when you think about it, I don't know if there's 30 new people good at their job. Even There's no way all of them are going to be as good as all the experienced ones I had in the first place. So once you guys collectively work together, you unite behind one person and become a union, then you have some say-so. Um, in history, there's a long history of unions. But the two you need to know about here, you see here, Knights of Labor. And they try to unite skilled and unskilled workers. Um, everything from ditch diggers to carpenters to those that worked in a the factory. They wanted one giant one, all the workers united together. Doesn't really work out too good. Unions have a poor history in, in America, and we'll talk more about that. The next one you have to know is the AFL, the American Federation of Labor. They're a little bit more successful. Um, and they try to create a union for each job, like carpenters union, steel union. Um, that whole concept, that idea behind the FL was founded by Samuel Gompers, which you need to know. Um, Samuel Gompers comes up with that concept. Uh, AFL is still technically around today. They've merged with CIO. So you might see like an AFL-CIO sticker somewhere. Unions do exist. Now, if you're listening to this and you're living in a different state, um, you might uh, say, yeah, we know we have unions all over. Like Ohio, you're allowed to have unions. Well, here in Texas, you're not allowed to have unions. Okay. Currently, the law is pretty much say it's up to the states if they ha allow unions or don't allow unions. Texas is a no union state. Now, it's based on the headquarters of the company. 
so for instance, in Texas, we have a, store, uh, a grocery store called HEB. HEB, headquarters in Texas, they don't have a union. Kroger, however, I don't remember which state it's headquarters, it's headquarters actually located, but they do allow, yeah, allow unions. So the Kroger's here in Texas, employees are part of a union. I say, what does that mean for employees? Well, it's more difficult to fire them. Um, you have to have reason, documentation. Employees have some protection. They can work together to get raises. They have a whole union of all Kroger employees. How do they operate this? Well, going back to my example I use, if you think about like Sebastian and the whole class, if Sebastian starts working for everybody in the whole school, he becomes too busy with the union to actually do his job. So everybody in the school says, hey, we'll take a dollar of our paycheck and put it towards you. It's just a dollar. It's not going to hurt us. But it gives Sebastian a paycheck every week so he can focus mainly on being a union leader. So that's how actually how far it's gone over time in some states. But ever since the 80s, it's been state by state. Now, these first unions really started with the concept of an eight-hour workday, eight hours for work, eight hours for rest, and then eight hours for whatever you want, spend time with your family, and do things, right? So that eight-hour workday is eventually what we see today. That's why if you work more than eight hours, five days a week, you actually get overtime. That's a law. I have to pay overtime. These unions also work for higher wages, safety codes in factories, like rules that you have to follow in the safety, equal pay for women, still working towards that, right? It's 2021. Uh, post child labor. This is what's kind of sad. Everybody's like, hey, you know, great. We got rid of child labor. We did the right thing. Put children in school. You got to be realistic about this. Um, the unions didn't want child labor because children were taking their jobs, not because they cared. Um, it's sad, but it's true. And then supporting restrictions on immigration. See, once people get over here and they get jobs, they worry about other people coming over and taking it from them. And so throughout U.S. history, um, it's kind of a very sad situation where we always constantly are blaming immigrants for slowdown in jobs, um, even though nobody else will take these jobs. Uh, but they're seen as cheap labor and competition. Um, so unions would unite to try to get rid of uh, immigration or make it more difficult to come over at the very least. Okay, so one of these guys that actually creates a monopoly on his own is that guy, Andrew Carnegie. Um, and he does it using the Pacema process. He produces a ton of steel. Um, and he dominates the whole steel industry. Now, Andrew Carnegie has, it's, it's hard to figure out if he's a good guy or a bad guy. Um, first, make sure you know that he's a guy connected with steel. So you might see his name quite a bit. Um, now, he's going to pay really low. He's going to force you to work 12-hour workdays, sometimes every day. He's going to crush any attempt for you to form a labor union. If he finds out group of you guys are talking about forming a union, you're all fired. Get you guys out right away. It was dangerous work, and he didn't do anything to help make work more safe or make life better for his workers. But he spent $350 million to build libraries and universities, um, music halls at Carnegie Hall was founded by him, if you guys ever heard of it. And this is what he believed. You know, he did give back. He gave back quite a bit when you look at the amount of money he actually donated and the amount of money he actually made. Now, he had an interesting life. He grew up as an immigrant, came over poor, worked his way up, and eventually using that Basima process was able to become a millionaire of his time, um, which is impressive 100 years ago by far. But it's always been a question. Is he a captain of industry, a good guy who created jobs for people and gave money back? Or is he a robber baron? the way he robbed people. like He could have paid them more. He was getting away with the bare minimum. There's no minimum wage back there or anything like that. Um, it, was, it, was, it was pretty ridiculous. But Andrew Carnegie did donate. So is he good or is he bad? You know, um, And when you look at him, it's hard to make that argument. And, you know, He'll be the most wealthiest guy ever, um, but he is going to give $100 million away for the public good. You know, Is he bad or is he good? He always had, he had this quote that I think best describes him, in my opinion, um, was, the man who dies rich dies disgraced. Andrew Carnegie's going to give away a lot of money by the time he dies. But the way he made that money was kind of sketch. Now, why does he give his money away? Well, that's a good question. Andrew Carnegie didn't necessarily give all his money away. He didn't believe in that. He thought that was horrible. He actually thought it made you look lazy or it made you become lazy. He goes, if I just give people money, they're going to be lazy. But I have a duty. I have a right. Now, the gospel of wealth, make sure you guys know this. The gospel of wealth itself, make sure you know this definition, was Carnegie's belief that his wealth was given to him by divine intervention. You know, God blessed him with this ability, these chances, and he made his money. 
and it's his responsibility and all rich people's responsibility. If God blessed you this way and gave it to you, it's your job to give use your money to encourage good habits among the poor. So he said, I can give people money, but that's not going to change anything. If anything, it makes you lazy, right? He was, but according to the gospel of the will, I, God gave me, blessed me with this chance to make money and making this money. I should return that favor by finding educational institutions, right? Have you ever seen those movies where those, God, have you ever seen those movies where the rich people buy the arts and they go to orchestras or ballets? That's one of the big reasons. Those things can't exist. Nobody's going to pay that much money to go to ballet. It's all about the wealthy people using their money to help encourage the arts. Without that, the arts will fall apart and you never learn. So to him and other wealthy people, you build museums. You donate to museums, whether it's art museum or natural science museum. You put your money towards that, and that's giving back to society because then it helps educate them, not just giving them directly money. Now, there's a word here. I have a uh, philanthropy. If you guys have ever heard of that word, you should know in case you see it. But that that's charity. I literally tell kids think of philanthropy as charity, um, and it could be uh, volunteer work, or it could be charity with like your hours, volunteer work, or it could be money. But this is uh, the question we have to ask. You know, is this guy really um, a good guy or a bad guy? You know, he gives up away so much money in his life, but how he makes it is is pretty harsh. Another guy we need to talk about is oil tycoon Rockefeller. John Rockefeller, he um interesting story. Just like uh, Carnegie, he starts with very little. Um, at one point, he was about his business partner was about to leave him. He's in a shack, a baby born. His wife, they barely surviving, barely enough food. They're trying to do the uh, whole thing with oil. Um, and they're, they're taking oil and refining it for kerosene and gasoline, and kerosene, primarily stuff like that. Um, but He's not doing too well. They can't compete. His business owner actually wants out. He's convincing him to stay. He's barely hanging on. But Rockefeller discovers that, hey, the problem with the oil industry is that all these companies have different products. He goes, oh, you can go to one company and they refine the oil with kerosene, and it could be really good kerosene. And then the next barrel you buy from this company is trash. It's not that good. So he comes up with this idea that every – Oil, every can of oil, every kerosene that's produced and refined by his company is, has a set standard it meets, which means it's going to all be at least this good and this worthy at this price. So you knew you could trust it, right? He calls it the Standard Oil Company. It's actually what it's going to be called. You can see it right here on the cartoon, Standard Oil. And he ends up dominating the market. Once he gets enough money... He does start doing a few shady things. At one point, he controls 90% of all the oil, and he becomes essentially a monopoly, also known as a trust. Remember, we call trust a monopoly, same thing. And that monopoly he owns controls all of the oil, and he actually becomes a monopoly in some sketchy ways. I mentioned earlier how he'll try to buy out his opponent, and they won't sell. Uh, you know, they work so hard for his business, they won't sell, they won't compete against him. And he'll go to the railroad and say, hey, if you ship their products, you don't get my business anymore. Well, the railroad has to give in. Um, he has such a larger business than everybody else. And so that oil, that other oil company would essentially die, go bankrupt, and he swoops in and buys them. So he had a very sketchy way of becoming a millionaire. But he does the same thing as Carnegie. He does give millions to build University of Chicago, the Rockefeller Foundation, and gives away a lot of money as well. And he made the same argument. Hey, charity is only useful if it helps you gain independence. And even if the independence is from him, and even if the independence is from a job that you work for him and his oil, uh, his oil company, you know? So that's the idea. Now, if you see this cartoon here, I've seen this before in Star Test. This, this uh, Senate oil company is octopus with their hands everywhere, from the Capitol building and legislation to the White House, the Supreme Court, to the congressman. They have their tentacles everywhere and they're controlling everything. And just like now, you know that. The more money you have, the bigger your corporation, the more power you have. This is the first time we have corporations in U.S. history, so this is a pretty big deal. And people are demanding that they do something about it. As a matter of fact, Rockefeller Oil Company will be broken up. The Sherman Antitrust Act was created because of him, and they go after him. Now, over time, we're going to see the oil companies start buying each other out, especially recently. 
um, with the 08 recession, we saw all the little ones get bought out by big oil companies, and even those are merging into one. And we'll see what happens with this coronavirus. Many oil companies can't stay up, can't stay under, and bigger ones are buying them out. So we may see another monopoly of sorts. But the federal government can step in and break that up, just like we're seeing them now with the tech industry saying, hey, you know, these monopolies, we need to start asking questions about this. So here I have a couple of definitions just to make sure you guys know. Some of you guys probably already got it from the uh, uh, from the um, lecture so far. But here it is written down in case you need an entrepreneur and philanthropy. Philanthropy is acts of charity. I already said that. Entrepreneur is someone or a group of people who start a business in, hope, in hopes of making money. Entrepreneurs take all the risk. You know, there's a lot of risk involved, but it could be a reward. Entrepreneur starts a business. These are modern day examples I put, and this thing this is kind of old, right? Um, Bill Gates with Microsoft. In 1998, he was charged with monopoly. He spent eight years fighting his lawsuits against the U.S. government. And what's kind of ironic is just a couple of weeks ago, Mark Zuckerberg is hit. And he's got like 40 something states suing him, um, saying he's a monopoly as Facebook controls Instagram. Um, other aspects of Facebook and they're controlling more. The What's Up app, that's a Facebook owned corporation. And as he tries in uniform, they're saying, hey, you're becoming a monopoly. And his argument is like, you approved all these mergers already and now you care. Um, and some people argued Steve Jobs with Apple and Apple iPhones, but that's really just an American thing. Um, over the course, if you look at the whole world, Android phones still outsell Apple phones. Uh, iPhones uh, to this day. Um, and even so, back in the day, when you'd argue, hey, Microsoft has a hold on everything, everything's Microsoft, every computer is Windows. Well, now we see a rise in Apple users. So that's why these guys are still allowed to exist so far. But now, are the captains of industries that's creating jobs or the robber barons? Yeah, that's what you got to look at. The problem with modern techs, in my opinion, is that these guys don't create jobs. Twitter has 5,000 employees. That's it. Um, when you look at this, Instagram, had, I think, like 13 employees when Mark Zuckerberg bought them for a million dollars um, a few years ago. So tech doesn't really create all those jobs. So do these guys donate? Bill Gates, Bill Gates donates a lot. He signed a pact that he'll donate half of his money before he dies. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg has donated quite a bit. I remember he donated a billion dollars to fight the Ebola virus when he came out uh, in 2007, 2008. Um, even uh, Steve Jobs was big on giving to charity, too. Um, but these guys aren't creating jobs like capitalism industry, um, but they are changing the game. And Jeff Bezos can be in here, and now we add Elon Musk. You know, what are these guys, good or bad? So with these titans of industry, if you want to call them, um, we see people have enough eventually. We have unions forming to fight back, and things really, really get pretty bad at what's called the hay market affair. Sometimes got called a Haymarket Square, town, town Square affair, but Haymarket affair for short. You gotta know this. You gotta know this. Um, essentially, the Haymarket affair really started with um, a strike that was going on the day before a strike worker was killed. A striker was killed. He was on strike working, uh, or he was on strike protesting, boycotting, uh, marching in front of uh, the factory. He's accidentally, uh, or not accident, he's murdered. Um, the union reps. Uh, represents uh, the union say, hey, we're going to have a rally tomorrow at Town Square, and that's Haymarket Square. They're having a rally there, and actually it's it's pretty bad. The uh, cops show up at the very end of the rally, and they're telling the union worker to get down, the union rep to get down, stop speaking to the crowd, because he's up there saying, hey, this is, you know, this is, we got to say peaceful, but this is what happens when the big corporations overrun us and do whatever they want. Um and the cops show up way too late anyways, but they make the situation worse. They start surrounding the crowd, and they tell him to get down. He goes, I have a right to freedom of speech. They start arguing back and forth, and then suddenly a bomb goes off. Yes, that's right. 1886, we have bombs in crowds. A bomb goes off. The police uh, pull out their weapons. They start shooting. Other people have guns, too. They start shooting. Seven cops and four workers die. Um, eight are arrested. Out of those eight, four executed. And only one was actually a night of labor. It would appear that we might have actually had uh, one was a night of labor um, of the four executed. Um, but just one being parts of nights of labor and the way everybody twisted everything, they, sh they portrayed union workers as people that are anti government and anti like anti-government altogether. And these people are against American government. They don't want government at all. They want chaos. They're anarchists. 
Um, they made unions look horrible so that even by 1910, only 5% of unions of workers in America were actually part of a union. Um, the Hay Market Affair, again, if any cops die, it's hard. Like At least half the country is always going to look at the other people as evil and more than that once people start dying. Oddly enough, if you're wondering, they've gone back and looked at this, and they're pretty sure the cops did most of the killing, even to each other, because they surrounded and started shooting, and we think friendly fire actually uh, led to some of their own deaths. But that's a haymarket affair. Um, it really kills the momentum for any um, unions in general. So summarizing real quick, the Gilded Age creates industrial factory complex, a system owners were separate from workers. Before this, these guys worked side by side. Now you've got the owners looking down at the workers doing all the physical labor. I'm mean, thinking of the blue collar workers are the ones wearing the blue overalls. White collar workers were the ones wearing uh, suits and stuff like that. Um, and the white collar shirts with ties. So this really sets up a, a them versus us mentality. And you can see why the government is going to be expected to interfere. Um, you can even see from these uh, political cartoons like Rockefeller here. Um, just rubbing the government for all its money, and you see all the oil and smoke in the background. That's going to set up the Gilded Age and also uh, regulation for the Gilded Age.